Thrones of Decay is looking like a massive win for Total War, and oh lord was it needed. Last eight months or so have been brutal, but everything I've seen and played so far seems like a massive step up in quality from Shadows of Change, and that rings true for the Empire as well, who are getting some hefty changes with the rework and the unique campaign mechanics for Elspeth von Draken. Gelt, Godrek and Felix, Carl Franz, all getting some tender love and care, that juicy TLC. There's a lot to get to, and kind of doing this on short notice, as I try to balance making videos with footage from the build itself, and covering the new CAs releasing themselves, so let's jump right in to the Empire overhaul, and that special stuff the Graveyard Rose is cooking up in her Kitchen of more. Really the only bad thing I've seen for Elspeth herself is that her Carmine Dragon looks exactly like the High Elf Dragons, obviously would have preferred to have a unique head or model to make it stand out a bit more, and as a general rule of thumb, I'd say that's a reasonable expectation for the main mounts of one of your three starting lords, but campaign mechanics and playstyle are really the meat of the update, they're obviously more important, and she has some good ones to play around with. Her Pale Scythe grants increased spell mastery and spell resist, growing in power as she casts spells, and she's going to make Purple Sun Azarius a very viable tool in the Empire's arsenal. Death's Timekeeper allows her to siphon the life from enemies, healing her own wounds, and her Carmine Dragon has a unique breath attack, the Coruscating Blast, and Darkwalker allows her to tread upon the veil between worlds, granting physical resistance and strider as she transitions from the physical world to the ephemeral rifts beyond. Really cool little note about that, Living Darkness synergizes with those abilities by stripping away enemy magic attacks, which will be fairly ubiquitous amongst her main enemies as we know. Demons of Chaos being a prime example, so some actually really good foresight from the balance team to ensure that her tanky passives allow her to, you know, actually tank, rather than be completely nullified by huge swaths of her main enemy's rosters. Now the Imperial Gunnery School is the main focus for Elspeth, just as it is the crown jewel of Null itself, and it will serve as her It Gets Workshop equivalent, where you can upgrade the gunpowder units of the Empire to your heart's content and give them some real nasty boons. From the screen, it appears there will be unique upgrades for infantry handgunner archetypes, like Hawkland Long Rifles, Known Ironsides, handgunners obviously, maybe Free Company as well, an upgrade section for Outriders and Pistoliers, mounted gunpowder troops, mortars, cannons, Hellblaster volley guns, Hellstorm rocket batteries, steam tanks, and land ships will all have their own unique archetypes, and each section of the school will have its own set of upgrades, so while the steam tanks might get more armor plating and longer range, the mortars get snipe, stalk, more explosive radius, and unique contact effects. These will be upgraded by schematics, which are earned through beats, buildings, and Battlestar Galactica. Fight lots of battles, you'll get lots of schematics, you will upgrade in the Imperial Gunnery School much more quickly. In the top left, you can see four tiers, which will advance as you upgrade that weaponry, and complete specific challenges called field testing, which encourage you to use different units and rack up kills with gunpowder troops. So I might say, get 5,000 kills with artillery, or deal 20,000 damage with cannons, which seems like a really interactive and fun way to encourage that core known playstyle of overwhelming firepower and technological advancements. Use the cool new units, blow stuff up, you will upgrade your gunnery school. Eventually, the Amethyst Armory will unlock, and this is where Elspeth von Draken and the Gunpowder Troops of the Empire create a rather unholy union in matrimony, where death magic and gunpowder create some super hellish contraptions. Expect the units and upgrades in this section, the Amethyst Armory, to be absolutely brutal, because if Null Ironsides are already deadly, I imagine they will be, you can imagine the torrents of carnage they'd unleash when infused with literal death magic, with Shaiish. Cannot wait to see what exactly those upgrades will entail, and how they will alter Imperial gunplay. Already one of the coolest elements of the roster, now you're suffusing it with death magic, that's gonna be dope. The Gardens of Moor are another important mechanic for Elspeth, who as we said is so suffused with purple stuff, she makes Mace Windu look like a wiener butt. I have no idea what that means, but it's provocative, it gets the people going. Essentially, she walks on the veil between worlds so that spirituality manifests in some rather peculiar ways. The idea behind this is that she can construct a limited number of black towers anywhere in friendly or neutral Empire territory, and then teleport herself and her whole army across vast distances to reinforce. So for example, if Wolfric the Wanderer was attacking Nordland in the north, you could construct a black tower in those provinces far from Nuln, help reinforce and buff them with the garrison and special bonuses from the building, 
then quickly teleport Elspeth to the rescue without having to march for, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine turns. So it will be quite robust as, say, like the World Roots mechanic for the Wood Elves, where you can just appear on another continent and create another mini empire all around each special magical forest. But especially in a campaign where the empire can struggle mightily and the AI sub-factions frequently get face-rolled really quick by a multitude of different threats, these Gardens of Moore should help you stabilize, control, and confederate the Empire in a much more efficient manner, and will synergize with some of the new mechanics that we'll talk about later on in the Empire Rework section. And really, it'll just help you create sick moments where you kind of just like ride of the Rohirrim out of a portal to the aid of your fellow man. Creating those kind of lore-friendly moments is, at least from my perspective anyway, one of the coolest things about a game like this one, and I really like to role play and do that kind of thing. So even if it's not necessarily, so even if saving a sub faction like Nordland isn't necessarily the best thing for your campaign, I really like playing in that manner when I'm in the right mindset for it. Now, when it comes to the legendary hero Theodore Bruckner, I am happy to announce that he does indeed have a fully armored option, helmet included, when mounted upon his unique Demigriff Reaper. And as he is the headsman and judicial champion of Noln, his kit centered around dueling and taking on expensive single entities, killing them in melee. Hand of Judgment makes him unbreakable when near an enemy character, and he'll have an execute ability similar to UN Bow, where once they drop low enough, you can insta-kill them with a well-timed ability. Titan Headsman reduces enemy defense and movement speed, so he can close in and rip them up with his sword Flyer's Bane and the Storm Lance. And finally, his Baleflame Amulet is the secret weapon Elspeth Von Draken gifts him in the lore, and is ultimately the artifact that kills Tamarkan and ends his threat for good. It goes supernova and nukes any character in the vicinity once its wearer is killed, burning them to ash and cinder. So the unbreakable attribute should keep Bruckner in the fight up until the moment he's slain, and then boom, big explosion, and gigantic single target damage to whichever lord or hero is unfortunate enough to be close by. Master Engineer has a grenade launcher, pretty sick, can drop pigeon bombs, ride a mechanical steed, or even drive a steam tank into battle. Drive him closer, he wishes to hit them with his sword. And oh yeah, steam tanks got some texture updates and big changes, where they're essentially immune to small arms fire from the front now, but not the rear, have an actual modeled crew, and are much more effective in melee and pushing through hordes of infantry while firing on the move. They got some big time buffs. I've been pushing for that internally for quite some time. Very excited to see what they can do. They look and play so much better now, and we'll be getting love as mount options for engineers, and with a new variant, the Steam Tank Volley Gun. You can imagine the pain and suffering that thing will cause when it sets up on an enemy flank and fires down the length of their battle line. Incredible looking unit. So much better than the original Steam Tank we had back in like 2016. It just looks way, way better. Empire Hero, looking pimpin' as well, has a repeater handgun with huge AP and missile damage values, bust for artillery, and a magic missile shot with high penetration and explosive repercussions. Known Ironsides, long requested, will be wielding mastercrafted handguns instead of the repeater rifles that were shown in the trailer, which is more lore accurate, but maybe a bit sad because I felt like the repeaters might have carved out a more unique niche and role for them, but we'll see. It's very possible their Black Powder Discipline passive will allow them to shoot at repeater speeds anyway, because it does increase their accuracy and reload speed, but I think Elite Repeaters would have been a really cool design space for a new Elite Infantry unit on the Empire roster. And then Hawkland Long Rifles are legit snipers, used to take enemy commanders or powerful monsters off the field from very long range, and apparently are packing some serious heat in and amidst their loins. Those cod pieces are popping off like Orville Red and Bakker. And the Knights of the Black Rose, arguably the best looking knight unit in the trilogy now. They look absolutely sick, with those salad helmets, the dark color scheme, and the ornate detail on their armor. They have red gauntlets to signify the blood they spill in melee, and they will be dedicated melee cavalry, with bonus versus infantry and a stat line designed to keep them in combat rather than cycle charging like Katana Cav from Shogun 2. And then, of course, we have the Marienburg Landship, the centerpiece unit for the Empire, a massive weapons platform with the Culverin mounted on the prow, and bristling gun teams that will punish anything that gets too close. Can run over stuff in melee while blasting them at point-blank range, can get huge mass and speed increases with full power, and will explode on death, destroying any infantry regiments nearby. Cannot wait to show that bad boy in action. 
it is a true centerpiece monster for the Empire. But remember, that's just the paid part of the DLC. Obviously, there are legacy updates and new star positions for the Empire as well. Some really fun changes across the board. Some of the Electric Counts for Carl Franz will now literally summon the Electric Counts, bringing any and all Electric Counts not besieged to your side to push back the stinking hordes of Chaos and Vampirism and Skaven, and Groby, Beastmen and Monsters and whatever other hellish things are currently annoying you. Imperial Authority is now a faction-wide mechanic for every Imperial sub-faction, and it will measure how well the Empire is doing as a whole, taking malices and modifiers and boons into account, depending how many sub-factions are still alive, how much territory is under Imperial control, and giving you rewards and desire to keep other Imperials around to help them defend their territory, and to basically just ensure that excursions and enemy invasions do not break into and rip the heart out of the Empire at large. So you'll be heavily rewarded for maintaining the strength and unity of those traditional Imperial regions, and if a bunch of territory falls to the enemy, you'll have even more incentive now to reclaim those regions and establish a new and lasting Empire of Man. Gotrek and Felix are full-on legendary heroes with unique skill trees now, a long-requested and heavily anticipated change. A lot of people are going to be super happy about that. And Emperor Karl Franz is getting some sick changes too. He can now safely march through Imperial territory without trespass penalties. Really nice. Starts his campaign in control of the Helmgart Mountain Fort, which should really speed up his early game and allow you to focus more on external threats, rather than laying siege for a bunch of turns to another Imperial settlement, while other sub-factions get raffle stomped and his new Emperor Decrees let you call Inquisitions to purge corruption, send aid to Electric Counts with spawned AI armies, and safely declare war without suffering fealty loss if there's a valid reason to do so. So a lot of new mechanics here that actually give him the tools to play and perform like a true Emperor and Leader of Men. Before, there were some good ideas, but now we have actual implementations that will let you truly play like the Emperor he's supposed to be. And finally, we have Balthazar Gelt, who has a new and spicy star position in the Far East. Welcome to Cathay, gentlemen. Here, he will strike up the bromance of a lifetime with Zhao Ming, the Iron Dragon, and they will have a lot to talk about. Remember that these two are the two greatest alchemists and lower metal users alive, save perhaps maybe a few specific Lords of Change, and both have been permanently crippled in their pursuit of that knowledge. Gelt was severely wounded, almost killed, in a freak gunpowder accident, but his mind remained intact, while Zhao Ming is kind of the opposite. He's unblemished externally, perfect in every way you could think of, gorgeous man, but has been driven partially insane by his alchemy and experimentation with Warpstone. So they are kindred spirits that should understand each other very well, and that will be reflected in good relations, increased allegiance points between the two factions, and a powerful alliance in a safe and defensible start position. In theory, anyway. Remains to be seen how mad Greases gets about their new budding bromance. Whether he's jealous or not should dictate whether a Gigantor horde makes its way across the Mountains of Morn or not. Gelt will be hit by a series of dilemmas early in his campaign that pave the way for his time in Cathay, or allow for his return to the Empire, having secured a lifelong friendship in the process. Probably similar to the Malice Darkblade, Dread Rock, Hag Grave dilemmas back in Warhammer 2, or Imric and Vol's Anvil. And on top of that, he has a unique campaign mechanic now centering around the Colleges of Magic, and this stuff sounds awesome. Whenever he fights a battle with wizards in his army, he generates arcane essays, which can be spent to gain instant recruitment of all lords of magic, granting faster access to spellcasters than any other faction in the game. Each lore of magic has their own progress bar, unlocking actions pertaining to that college, and cataclysm spells and special abilities tied to Ulgu, Shaish, Gur, Azir, Shimon, and so on. Shadow magic, as we know, is all about concealment and misdirection, so you can purchase 100% ambush success chance buffs for Ulgu, that type of thing. I haven't gotten a chance to play Gelt yet, but depending how far they push that mechanic and how robust the selection of upgrades you can get with arcane essays are, that could be incredibly cool. And obviously, a doom stack of Altdorf wizards sounds like a really unique way to play, alongside all that Vietnam artillery. I know that Amber Wizards will be able to summon Incarnate Elementals of Beasts, Jade Wizards will be able to heal your entire army with just a click of a button, lots of crazy synergies and upgrades available for each wind of magic, which sounds really fun. 
The Empire has historically not been my favorite faction to play in any of the Total War Warhammer games. I've always felt like they had one of the more boring rosters and their unit models and mechanics were lacking a bit of the flair they have in official artwork and army bucks. But this update seems to be adding a lot of fun and exciting tools to their arsenal and the new units should add a lot more flavor and killing power as well. I have always loved the full themed armies and at this point the only major one we're missing now is Middleland and the Cult of Ulrich. Nolan's Gunpowder playstyle combined with Death Magic is going to be a joy to play, I think. So let me know what y'all think about these Empire updates. Personally, very excited to try them out myself. Hope y'all enjoy, and I'll see you all in the next video.